Previously, we've talked about a grammar of graphics, and in this video, we're going to be talking about a grammar of data wrangling. Uh, so a grammar of data wrangling is based on the concepts of functions as verbs that manipulate data frames. And the package that does this within the tidyverse is called dplyr. This package offers a variety of functions, each of which are verbs. And I'm not going to go through this entire list right now uh, because the kind of the purpose of this video and the next one is to introduce each one of these functions with examples that go along with them. But I do want to draw your attention to the fact that things like select, arrange, slice, filter, mutate are all verbs. So majority of these are verbs that we apply to the data frame to either transform the data that we have or get some useful information out of it. Um, so there are four rules of dplyr functions. The first argument is always a data frame. That's the first rule. The second one is that the subsequent arguments say what to do with that data frame. They always return a data frame. So they take in a data frame and then they return one and they don't modify in place. And what we mean by that is that when we apply a function from dplyr to the data frame, uh, we're not changing that data frame on the spot. We have the option to resave our result, either um, overwrite the existing data frame that we have or as a separate object, but we're not modifying the data frame in place. The important takeaway lesson about that fourth bullet point is that you should feel free to be adventurous. If you're thinking, is this how I would do a certain task? Just go ahead and apply it. There's always a way to recover. You're not changing your original data frame until you explicitly save over it. Um, you haven't actually changed anything that you started with. And even if you do, there's always a way to go back and recover things. Uh, but I think it's useful to know that you can actually apply the function, see the result, before you decide to save the output or not. Um, the data set that we're going to use as an illustrative example is on hotel booking. So we have data on two hotels. One of them is a resort hotel and the other one is a city hotel. And each row in our data set represents a hotel booking. The goal for the original data collection uh, was a development of prediction models to classify a hotel booking's likelihood to be canceled. So if you're interested in learning about this model, you can see the referenced paper. And the idea there is that um, people book a uh, make hotel bookings and then sometimes they don't show up for them or maybe even cancel them. So hotels need to be smart about both not overbooking their rooms so they don't have a guest that arrives one evening and then all of a sudden there's no room for them. They don't want to find themselves in that situation but they also don't uh, want to overbook themselves to the point of thinking maybe some of these reservations are going to be canceled so uh, with enough lead time you might want to actually overbook your hotel thinking on the day of arrival, uh, not everybody's going to show up. So that's the data set that we're going to work with. But instead of working on the development of that model, we're going to be working on some data wrangling steps. So the data set I have is stored as a CSV file. So I start by reading that in. Um, we can see a list of the variables here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but a couple that are important is the hotel variable tells me whether it's a city hotel or a resort hotel. And the is canceled variable is an indicator variable for whether the booking was canceled or not. That's prior to the arrival date. Um, and lead time tells me how how much longer before the arrival date the booking was made. Uh, we can use the glimpse function to take another look at our um, hotels data set. We can see that we have 119 and through. Uh, 19,390 bookings, so almost 120,000 bookings in this data set. And for each one of these bookings, we have information on 32 variables. Suppose that I wanted to select a single column from this data set. So I just want to view the lead time variable, which is the number of days between booking and arrival date. So I want you to think back to when you could travel and think about how much far enough in advance did you use to book hotels. In this particular case, the first observation, so the first booking was made 342 days prior to the booking, that's almost a year. The second booking was made 737 days prior to uh, the day of arrival, so that's almost two years. So how did this function work though? Let's kind of dissect it. We start with the function, which is a verb, in this case, select. 
The first argument is the data frame that we're working with. So that's the hotel's data frame. The second argument is lead time. This is the variable we want to select. And the result becomes a data frame with 119,390 rows. So that's the same as the original data frame, but only one column as opposed to all 32. So we have start with um, data frame. So they always expect a data frame to begin with uh, these dplyr functions, and they always yield a data frame as well. They didn't yield a vector for us, for example. Even though it's only a single column, it's reported back to us as a data frame. Um, so what if I wanted to select multiple columns? Say I wanted to view only the hotel type and lead type. In this case, what I can do is I can actually just keep adding the variables. The first argument has to stay hotels, which is the name of the data frame, but then I can string along as many variables as I want to select. And depending on the number of variables, the resulting data frames number of columns will be determined. The number of rows for the resulting data frame will stay the same because we're selecting columns and not chopping up the rows yet. So what if we wanted to select these columns and then arrange the data in descending order of lead time? Okay, so we want the highest lead time on top and then um, going down in terms of uh, lead time. What I can do is I can say, I wanna start with the data frame and then I wanna select the two variables that I have, hotel and lead time, and then I want to arrange them in descending order of lead time. So I can see, for example, that the highest lead time of 737 days in this data frame happened in a resort hotel, or maybe a wedding, I'm really not sure. The next one was 709 days, also in a resort hotel. And then we have a bunch of bookings in a city hotel that were 629 days prior to, made prior, uh, 629 days prior to arrival. So when I was reading these, I kept saying, and then, and that's where I was using this uh, pipe operator, which is what we're going to talk about next. So what do I mean by pipes? So in programming, a pipe is a technique for passing information from one process to another. So we start with the data from hotels and pass it to the select function. Then we select the variables hotel and lead time. And then we arrange the data frame by lead time in descending order. So this pipe operator is actually implemented in a package called McGritter, but we never really have to load this package explicitly since when we load the tidyverse, because it's such a crucial component of working with these tidyverse functions, the tidyverse package loads it with us. So in R, uh, when package developers develop packages, they also get to rely on other packages so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And to make it a smooth experience for uh, users of their packages, they can say, whenever you're using my package, I'm going to load for you other packages that I am assuming you're going to need to use as well, so you don't have to do this additional task. That's what Tidyverse does with this original package McGritter, which implemented the pipe operator. So, any guesses as to why this package is called McGritter? Um, if you're familiar with this art piece by Magritt, which basically says in French, um, this is not a pipe, that's where the, um, it's a picture of a pipe is what it is. Uh, that's where this is coming from. And here we have the um, dplyr pipe, uh, which basically lives in the package called Magritter. This package uh, implements other operators as well, but this is the one that we're going to be working with for the context of this course. So how does a pipe work? You can think about the following sequence of actions. We're gonna find our keys, unlock our car, start our car, drive to work, and then park it. Um, expressed as a set of nested functions in R, the pseudocode for this would look something like this. I find my keys. With the keys that I find, I start my car. With the car that I started, I drive to work. And with the car that I drove to work, I park. So if I'm nesting things, I need to start at the innermost parentheses and I need to basically figure out which one that is and then I work my way out. Uh, writing it out using pipes gives it a more natural and easier to read structure. I find my keys, 
And then with the keys that I found, I start the car. Remember that the pipe operator will take what comes before it and use it as the first argument of the next line of code. So it is, I find my keys and then I start my key car with the keys that I found. And then with the car that I started, I drive to work. So I can add additional arguments to my functions that will be tagged on after the first argument that got passed on by the pipe operator. And then with the car that I drove to work, I park. So a note on piping and layering. The pipe operator is used mainly in dplyr pipelines. And basically what we say is that we pipe the output of the previous line of code as the first input of the next line of code. While the plus operator is used uh, in ggplot2 plots uh, for layering. So we create the plot in layers separated by the plus. Wouldn't it be nice if these were the same operator? Yes, but they happen to be not uh, because they were developed at different points in history and uh, they kind of needed to stay that way. But thankfully, um, even though it might uh, seem like, okay, this is going to get confusing between the two things that we're going to use so regularly, um, R has some nice affordances for warning you uh, when you mix these two things up. So if in a dplyr pipeline, you were to use the plus operator, um, the error you get is actually not super helpful. What it will say is that it can't find the object hotel. And you're probably thinking, um, I already have the object um, hotel in my data frame. But the reason why I can't find it is that the data frame itself didn't get passed to the select function properly. And therefore, it can't find the variable named hotel in it. Um, if you use the pipe operator, you'll get the result that you expected. In a ggplot2, if you accidentally use the pipe operator, R is pretty smart about that and will actually tell you, hey, there's an error. Did you use the pipe instead of the plus? So if we were to then change it with a plus, we can get uh, the visualization that we expected to get. In terms of code styling, uh, many of the styling principles are consistent across the pipe operator and the layering operator, the plus. We always want to leave a space before it, and we always uh, want to have a line break after that, especially for pipelines with more than two lines. So for example, if I was to look at this ggplot code, um, I don't have any of the spaces around my equal signs or anything. And also, we want to have a, an actual a line break after the plus. Now, this is not required in the sense that even if you had the first line of code, your code would run. Uh, but just because it runs, it doesn't mean that it's the appropriate way to do things. The reason why we actually want to lay out our code in a particular way is that um, it makes it a lot easier to debug this way because you can really see visually which uh, geom or which feature of the plot corresponds to exactly which line in your code. 